Okay, good morning. Uh, we have a very, very um, lengthy presentation today, so I think we'll go ahead and get started to make sure we can get all this good information out um, within the time frame that we've set aside today. Um, so welcome to today's webinar, School Nutrition, Rethink How Your Students Refuel. My name is Alicia Hoke, and I am with Penn State Hershey Pro Wellness Center. Along with me today is Lauren Green with Pro Wellness Center and Kate Hoy, manager of the Cornell University Ben Center. And you'll hear uh, a little bit from all of us today. We have a lot of great information to share in this hour. But before we go any further, I'd like to mention that the funding for this webinar is provided as part of the mini grant program delivered by Penn State Hershey Pro Wellness Center. We'd like to thank the Pennsylvania Department of Health for providing funding through the Preventative Health and Health Services Block Grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. A few housekeeping points as we move through today's presentation. All the participants' phones and microphones have been muted to ensure that the information shared by all of our presenters today can be heard clearly. If you'd like to submit a question or a comment um, about today's presentation or questions that you'd like to have answered, you can enter those in the questions panel, and we'll reserve time today at the end of the webinar to answer submitted questions. This webinar is being recorded, and a link to the recording and handouts will be emailed following the webinar. If you uh, requested a certificate of completion, a link for that will also be included in that email. So our agenda for today's webinar includes first an overview of who Pro Wellness Center is and what we do, the importance of good nutrition for our students, We'll take a look at the Smart Snacks in School Guidelines. Kate Hoy will talk to us about the Smarter Lunchroom Movement. We'll look at methods to involve the whole school community in school nutrition. And we'll close with a few key tools and resources for activating healthy nutrition policies and practices in your own school environment. At the end of today's webinar, our attendees should be able to identify the Smart Snacks in School guidelines for all foods sold in school. They should discuss methods to increase the involvement of the whole school community in school nutrition, and summarize several tools and resources available for use in the improvement of your school's overall nutrition. We're going to be using the polling mechanism several times throughout this webinar, so let's go ahead and test it out. Let's see who's on this webinar today. So a poll should have just appeared on your screen, and uh, if you could indicate for us what title best describes your role in your school. And if you select other or not affiliated with a school, uh, please share your role by typing it in the questions panel. Okay, so it looks like the answer is coming in or slowing down. So let me go ahead and show you who's on our poll today, or who's on our webinar today, I should say. Okay, so as you can see, um, we've got a, a wide variety of participants today. Um, some of them are teachers, uh, a good percentage are other, and so um, certified school nurses are answers that are coming in, um, and, and that's great. We're, we're happy to have all the different types of, of school personnel, um, parents, administrators, et cetera, here with us today. So let me tell you a little bit about Penn State Hershey Pro Wellness Center. 
Um, Penn State Hershey Pro Wellness Center is committed to educating and inspiring youth and their families to eat well, engage in regular physical activity, and become champions for bringing healthy choices to life. The vision of our center is to reduce the incidence of childhood obesity. Uh, and we are a trusted resource for educational programming, um, partnerships with schools and other community-based organizations. And we also obtain funding to support our work and research initiatives. Many, much of that funding um, is passed through in the form of mini grants for schools. Our website, which is shown on your screen, has many resources, including the opportunity to sign up to be a healthy champion. And our Healthy Champions program is available for schools in Pennsylvania and includes resources like event planning guides and promotional templates, um, things like news releases for great activities and events that you're holding, um, a customized school champions report to let you know uh, after you complete an assessment where you fall with other schools in Pennsylvania, priority for Healthy Champions for funding, and Hershey Bears, Bears initiatives. And you can register to be a Healthy Champion at the website that's on the screen. Um, and you should know that after the presentation today, we will be sharing a link that has all of the websites that we talk about today. So if you can't access them while you're on the webinar, you'll be able to access them afterwards. So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to our next guest speaker, Lauren. And she's going to talk about the need for good nutrition in schools. Thanks, Alicia. So now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the need for good nutrition. If you're joining us today, it's likely that you're already aware of the importance of good nutrition for students and staff at your school. Nutrition plays an integral role in not only physical health, which can affect school attendance, but also mental health, which can affect academic performance. According to the National Institutes of Health, a healthy diet helps children maintain strength, energy, and a healthy immune system. A healthy diet helps children to continue to grow up healthy and strong. And a healthy diet helps to prevent obesity and rate-related issues uh, for in the future. The National Association of State Boards of Education believes that health and success in school are interrelated. Schools cannot achieve their primary mission of education if students and staff are not healthy and fit physically, mentally, and socially. And because many of you may be educators, school officials, or staff members, not only is the health of your students important to you, but academic success is also a priority. Current research shows the great impact of nutrition on the learning abilities of children. Dr. Philippa Norman is the author of Feed Your Brain, How to Boost Your Brain Power with Food, a hands-on guide for students to learn how their brain works and learn how to choose the healthiest brain foods. She states that by nourishing the brain with healthy food and water, you will optimize the internal environment, enabling students to truly engage in the classroom environment and achieve their potential. Much evidence supports the notion that nutrition plays an integral role in academic achievement. We've noted in past webinars that healthier students are better learners, which is supported by several pieces of literature that have been summarized in reviews released by the Campaign for Education Equity and the United States Department of Health and Human Services. The research continues to show that healthy eating can lead to higher grades, better memory, more alertness, faster information processing, and improved health, all leading to better school attendance. Additionally, scientific reviews have documented that school health programs can have positive effects on educational outcomes, as well as health risk behaviors and health outcomes. With this scientific research supporting the relationship between nutrition and academic performance, it was time for an up-to-date regulatory guidance for food sold in schools. The Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act was legislated in 2010. This was a crucial step in improving the overall health status of our schools. It had been nearly 30 years since any changes or improvements have been made to school lunch and breakfast programs. This act allowed the United States Department of Agriculture to make important revisions to school nutrition programs, 
that should serve to greatly improve nutrition and the hunger safety net for millions of children. Now we're going to try a second poll. This time, we would like to know how your school's nutrition program is managed. Please note if you select other, we'd like you to specify that in the questions panel if you would be able to. It looks like answers have slowed down. And it looks like a large chunk of the schools manage their own nutrition program. So I'm going to share the results with you. Okay. So it looks like I said 58% of the schools manage their own nutrition programs. 27% have an external company. Um, which is actually a large percentage. Um, for schools that manage their own nutrition program, it might be important for you to make sure you know who your man nutrition manager is, make contact with them, show them your support, and if you currently work as part of the nutrition program, perhaps attending a school meal as if you were a student, kind of getting a student perspective might be a good idea. For schools who have an external company, Maybe a good idea is to create a personal bond between the school and the company. Liaisons can aid in communication and verification of the guidance, uh, guideline compliance. And personal relationships can help to bring businesses together. All right, so we're going to move on. Thank you for participating. Now we're going to get into the Smart Snacks in School guidelines. As a result of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, standards were developed for all foods sold in schools. The Smart Snacks in School guidelines are to be implemented for the 2014-2015 school year. This section will provide an overview of the general standards and nutrient standards that make up the Smart Snack guidelines and how these guidelines apply to competitive foods in schools. So what does this mean for your school? Let's review the what, where, and when of how these standards apply. What do the standards apply to? Standards apply to competitive foods sold in schools. So let's take a look at what the term competitive food means. Competitive food, as defined by the United States Department of Agriculture, Food and Nutrition Service, is all food and beverages sold to students on the school campus during the school day, other than those meals reimbursable under programs authorized by the National School Lunch Program and the Child Nutrition Act. Where do these standards apply? First, let's define the word campus. According to the United States Department of Agriculture, a school campus includes all property under the school or district's jurisdiction. So this means that competitive food includes food sold a la carte in the cafeteria, in school stores, at snack bars, in any vending machines on your campus, and for fundraisers. Not applicable weekends or after school. So try to consider all the possible areas this may affect. For example, does your school have student-run snack bars? Do you know where every vending machine is located? Does the band hold fundraisers during the school day? It would be beneficial to take a step back and look at the big picture. Try not to limit your thinking to only the cafeteria. Now we're going to look at when the standards apply. According to the Department of Education, for the purpose of the Smart Snacks in School Guidelines, a school day begins at midnight the night before and continues until 30 minutes after the end of the official school day. <coughs> Excuse me. Although these standards are not required on weekends or at concession stands, for sporting events or fundraisers that fall outside of the defined school day. <coughs> Sorry about that. 
schools are encouraged to expand the influence of these standards into as many areas as possible. <clears throat> Doing so further supports the benefit of healthy nutrition choices during the school day and beyond. <coughs> now we are going to review the general standards for competitive foods. For food items to qualify as a competitive food, it must meet at least one of four provisions. It must be a whole grain product. This means the first ingredient listed is a whole grain or contains 50% or more whole grains by weight. If the first ingredient is water, the second must be a whole grain. Or the first ingredient must be a fruit, vegetable, protein, or dairy. Or the food item is a combination food with at least half cup fruit or vegetable. Or the food item must have 10% daily values of at least one nutrient of public health concern, such as fiber, vitamin D, calcium, or potassium. However, this qualification standard will become obsolete July 1, 2016. So it would be beneficial to get in the habit of choosing food items that meet the other qualifications so changes to your products won't be necessary in only two years. If you have a product that meets at least one of these standards, then you can use the information nutrition information label to determine if it also meets all nutrient standards. <clears throat> if it does meet all nutrient standards, then your food item can be considered a compliant competitive food. Now that you know how these standards apply to your school, let's consider the nutrient standards that will need to be reviewed for all competitive foods sold in school. Calorie standards will affect all snack items, side dishes, and entree items sold a la carte. Sodium standards apply to each portion as served. You want to keep this information in mind when determining if your food item complies with the SMART snack guidelines. Limits on total sugars apply to all food items. Limits for saturated trans and total fats apply to the food item as per portion served. Beverages are also included under the Smart Snack in School guidelines. There are no size limits on plain water. There are, however, some size limits on non-fat and low-fat milk and 100% fruit and vegetable juices. However, these options should be available for all students in all grades. For additional specifications, please reference the United States Department of Agriculture Food and Nutrition Service. And please remember that these nutrient standards for food items apply to all grade levels. I'd like to note that the information provided today for food and beverages is only meant to be an overview. This information is intended to initiate your learning of the Smart Snacks in School guidelines. To ensure your school is effectively implementing the guidelines, we recommend using the United States Department of Agriculture Food and Nutrition Service website and your local contact at the Pennsylvania Department of Education. The USDA Food and Nutrition Service website is home to many documents to help your school understand and implement the Smart Snacks in School nutrition standards. The staff at the Pennsylvania Department of Education in the Division of Food and Nutrition are also available to assist you with questions as you explore changes to your school's nutrition program. The link to these resources will be included in the resources list that Alicia mentioned on our website within a few days of this webinar. Thank you, Lauren. That was a great overview of the Smart Snacks in School guidelines. And now we're going to switch gears again and move into an area that Kate Hoy is going to share with us. So we'll talk, uh, Kate will share with us today um, ideas for supportive nutrition environments related to the Smarter Lunchrooms movement. So um, Kate Hoy, the manager of the Cornell University Ben Center, is going to share with us today. Hi everyone, thank you so much for, um, for having me this morning and for giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you about the uh, Smarter Lunchrooms movement 
and uh, our, uh, our research. So the very first thing that I want to say is congratulations for being up and functional at this early hour in the morning. Um, I, I have the privilege of managing the Cornell Center for Behavioral Economics and Child Nutrition Program. And I'm really happy to be working again with uh, Pennsylvania. It's been a couple times that I've come down and done some work in your area. So even though it's remote, um, I love you, PA. So I've done work in about 20,000 schools across the country looking at creating environments that encourage kids to take and eat healthful foods. Um, I work in conjunction with the Cornell Food and Brands Lab, which is a consumer market research center that looks at why adults make the food decisions that they make and how that applies to children. Do children, in fact, make the same decisions that adults do when provided with the same opportunities? The um, core values of our center include providing low-cost, no-cost changes to lunchrooms across the country so that we can help promote those helpful eating behaviors and make sure that it's sustainable as well as scalable because we want to make sure that every school, regardless of income level or of um, their their natural their situation, can actually make these changes. So the very first thing that I want to talk about is I want to build a base here, and this is some of the research that's come out of our research lab. I work with Dr. Brian Wan, I think up here at Cornell, and there are a few things that we know based off of his research. For example, that we eat more when we're distracted, about 28% more, in fact. This is why we tell people they need to get up, get away from their desk, be more mindful when they're eating, and pay attention to the actual food that they're putting into their mouth. The second thing that we found in our research lab is larger plate, larger meal. This is the standard uh, portion distortion is what we refer to it as. And this means that, on average, we're eating about 25% more based off the size of our plate. Now, what's interesting about this is that our plate size has continued to grow over the past 100 years, meaning that even now, today, our dinner plates are actually what the platters were for our forefathers 100 years ago. Even our perception of size has gotten bigger in the past 100 years. If I had asked you to draw a picture of the Last Supper today, and if you're anything like me, which is not an artist, it would probably be six figures. The size of our plates being drawn would actually be three times larger than the plates that we would have drawn 100 years ago. Something that I find very interesting from our research is this notion of fat-free. So when given regular granola or what we call fat-free granola, individuals ate 35% more of the fat-free granola. Now this is what we call a health halo. A health halo occurs when you think you're doing something positive for yourself, and as a result, you overconsume. This happens a lot of times in our in our population. For example, uh, gluten-free, sugar-free, low-fat, low-carb, um, local, organic, raw. I recently saw a bag of sugar in the grocery store that was listed as gluten-free. These are the kinds of um, health halos that exist in our world. Same situation occurs when you go to Subway. You anticipate getting a six-inch veggie sub, but because it's $5 foot long month, you get a foot long, you add extra cheese because you need protein, then you end up getting a meal because it only costs 50 cents more, and you walk out with a foot long sub, a drink, a cookie, and chips when you had intended on getting something that was good for you, like a six-inch veggie sub. The final thing that we know based off of our research and our work with Dr. Brian Wansink is that if it's in front of you, you eat it. So hide the candy. When you put a candy dish inside the drawer of your desk rather than on your desk, you'll eat three fewer candies every single day. Now the benefit of knowing this is that if it's candy, we eat it, great, but it also works for helpful things. For example, whole fruits and whole vegetables. So we obviously know that there's a, there's a challenge when it comes to school food. We are challenged with the improvement of nutritional content of meals. Luckily, the USDA has done this for us, so we really don't have to add this to our plate. We also need to maintain low cost and participation, as well as encourage those long-term healthier decisions. Now, the thing that is the bottom that's folded is obviously the one that I feel most strongly about. 
most of us, when we talk about school food and health environments, are talking to other people who already work in school food or in school health environments. We don't really take the time to develop a 30-second elevator pitch to talk to those random individuals out there who are building negative perceptions of the spaces that we work in. So I'm going to get on my soapbox for a minute and say that anyone who works in school food or in school wellness is an entrepreneur. They need to go out. They need to make sure that they are running a, participate, running a program that is high in participation, low in cost. They're managing cost and benefits. They're making sure that they have the HR, the ops, the finance, as well as marketing under their belt. This is a very um, important aspect of school food that I feel many of us are battling when it comes to the public perception of school food. Now, I want you to put on your consumer hat for a moment, and let's just pretend that uh, you've been busy all day long, right, because this is just a hypothetical situation. So you go home, or you're on your way home after a very long day at school and work. You've had meetings all day long, starting as early as a webinar at 8 a.m. And your significant other calls you and says, I need you to pick up bread from the, school, from the store on your way home. Now you get to the store, and they don't have your bread. What do you do? This is what we call a consumer tea. A consumer tea exists when you go to a location with one particular product in mind. If you get there and that product doesn't exist, you are faced with two options. You can either find a suitable alternative, or you end up leaving, and you're no longer a consumer or a customer in that particular store. Now, this happens with our children just as much as it happens with us. So the contentious case of chocolate milk is brought up. If we as adults come in and say, I know what we're going to do, we're going to eliminate all sugared, any sodium, any kind of opportunity for a flavored beverage, our kids who come in with this consumer product in mind are then faced with a consumer tea. I will either no longer be a consumer in your establishment, or I'm going to find a suitable alternative. Now, in our studies, what we have found is by removing flavored milks from schools, you actually see a decline in participation equivalent to 11%. So 11% of your students end up being what we would call fence sitters. They're kids that only participate for a particular program. A lot of these principles that I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes are ways that you can help encourage this 11% to make a suitable choice, a suitable alternative choice rather than walking away from your program. So the very first principle I talk about is something called choice architecture. Now, choice architecture is something every single one of us has done or used, being that we work with children. This is designing a choice so that someone makes the decision you want them to make without them ever knowing about it. So for example, when dealing with children, do you want to go to bed now or in five minutes? The decision has already been made. You're going to bed. It's just a matter of empowering the individual to make the choice. Same situation when we talk about discipline. Do you want to sit on the stairs or do you want a spanking? Either way, you've been given a choice. And either way, I'm empowering you to make the decision. Now, the choice, although they may not see it, is exactly the same. Now, that's what makes this very cheap for us to implement in school because both A and B, while they are set up as a choice, are very similar in nature and in product. So for example, in school food, would you like an apple or an orange with your meal? At the end of the day, it's still a piece of fruit. And at the end of the day, that simple suggestion increases the taking and consumption of fruit by almost 64%. So this is something that we highly encourage individuals to use to build the choice in, even if the default is something that is almost exactly the same as the choice that you're trying to get them to make. There's a couple other things that we know about it, food and economics and psychology. First, there's something called reactance. Reactance occurs when you feel there's been a threat to your freedom. Now, this happens, for example, when I say you cannot have cereal. The very first thing that pops into your head is cereal. You start wondering, is it all kinds of cereal? Is granola a cereal? Does this count? Or if you're like me, who are you to say that I can't have cereal? Now, this is something that we've also seen quite regularly when dealing with children, especially in school food. 
A great example of this is something called limit on ketchup. And we all know that ketchup pumps are very difficult to police when it comes down to school food. And in one school in Ohio, they were having some difficulty with ketchup pumps. The administration felt that students were abusing the ketchup pumps, and as a result, they needed to go. So they went to PC, portion control packet, but then they went one step further, and they made a ketchup Nazi. So at the end of every school food lunch line, there was an individual, a full-time equivalent, standing there and handing out a single ketchup packet to every student as they left. Now, how do you think the kids reacted? Most of them were not that positive, if that's what you're thinking. A vast majority of the students, while of course having the verbal uprising that occurs when we limit their freedom, also began doing a few other things that we know. For example, some of them were young entrepreneurs. And recognizing that they were not planning on using their ketchup packet, began to sell their ketchup packets to kids who needed their ketchup packet. So a black market of ketchup erupts in this school. Then we have some kids who decided they don't need to participate in this gaming system. My mom buys a very large ketchup bottle from Costco every single month. I could just sidestep this whole thing. And they did. And they began bringing ketchup from home. Now we've got ketchup in lockers. Custodians, everyone like that, are starting to say, this is how we get ants. You can't have ketchup and mockers. Now, this goes on for about four months in the school before it finally starts to fizzle down. So all the administrators are like, yes, we have won. All the kids are happy. They're not abusing ketchup. And the black market has been suppressed. Flash forward to graduation. A graduating class of 1,400 seniors, as they cross the graduation stage and receive their diploma, they handed their principal A, ketchup packet. Okay. Now, something that was relatively small became something that is now a community issue. All the parents are calling in. What's going on with the ketchup? It's not like it's drugs. How can I manage this problem? How can my kids make helpful choices if we remove all choice from the equation? So the next year, the ketchup pumps went back. So this is an example of reactance in a school food situation. Now, the flip side of reactance is something called attribution. Attribution is when you are provided with a choice, you feel almost 40% better about it, about anything. I can give you your favorite candy bar, and you would rate it a 6 out of 10 on a Likert scale. If I gave you your favorite candy bar and another candy bar to compare it to, you would still choose your favorite candy bar, but you would rate it a 9 out of 10. So attribution is the public health holy grail, because not only do they feel good about their choice, but they also are more likely to repeat their choice. For example, would you like carrots or celery with your meal? When we provided this, this prompt to students, we ended up finding that whichever vegetable the students chose, whether it be carrots or celery, they ate 91% of it. We also know that we make food decisions in two different states, a hot state and a cold state. The hot state tends to be taste, convenience, size, the bigger the better. This is going to the grocery store without a list and hungry, all right? Now, the cold state is when we eat for price, for health logic, for information. This is going to the grocery store with a list and having had a snack. Now, which one of these states do you think our children are in more often? Yeah, they're in the hot state. There's a lot of stimuli. There's a lot of things going on. They can't typically discern how they feel until they're already in the hot lunch line, and as a result, this is why some of our foods that tend to be more um, satiating, those higher fat, lower calorie, or higher calorie, lower nutrient density foods, tend to be more appealing as they make their decision. Now, the USDA has removed a lot of those foods for us, especially with these smart snack rules. However, this hot state still will predominantly make the choice for us when they go through our lunch line. So what does this mean for kids? What do we know, what do we know about kids? Why do kids generally eat less healthfully? Well, I've talked a lot about rational decision-making processes, but kids aren't rational. In fact, the most recent research indicates that kids don't fully develop their frontal lobe until they are 21 years old. It's even later for men, 25, unfortunately. Now, with that meaning, that means we can't expect that our kids should act rationally while they're in our space. They also have a very little, long, very little understanding of long-term consequences. You can't come up to a child and say, honey, you can't eat that. You're going to be obese. 
Because that child's going to look at you with funky eyes and say, excuse me, I don't know what that means. And second of all, who cares? Because I'm not there yet. And you would tell me if I was. They also don't understand the marketplace as they go skipping down the cereal aisle and all their favorite sugared cereals are right where they can touch them. That's mighty convenient. They're also in a hot state all the time. Like I said, there's lots of stimulation going on with these children. And most of the time, these kids are just getting used to eating only three meals a day. Finally, they react to paternalism. And that means they react to when someone says no. And we're not talking about high school seniors who are willing to wait four months before they hand a ketchup package to their principal as a prank. Most kids react within five seconds of the situation. You have five seconds until they melt down on the ground, screaming, kicking, biting, telling everyone that you're a horrible person. Okay. Now, knowing this means that we can help design our space. Because some kids, actually all kids, find at least one helpful food to be appealing or acceptable. So we need to try to lead them to the right choice. That's where smarter lunchrooms came in. So we designed the lunchroom to gently encourage decisions that we want them to make. We want them to make sure that they're having access to helpful food. But then also, we remove the reactant. We're not banning foods. In fact, most of the time, if we want kids to help make a better choice, we provide more choice to them. Now, I'm not saying you need to go out and buy lots of stuff so that you have tons of things to give them variety. This is what we call a perceived variety. So simply suggesting that there's a choice can be enough to help change behavior. For example, Naming foods can help enhance taste expectations. Going from carrots to x-ray vision carrots doubles consumption of carrots in elementary and middle schoolers. The bean burrito became the big bad bean burrito, and it increased sales by 40%. They sold out by the second lunch period. So these are six basic principles that we encourage you to consider when you're talking about your school food environment. We talk about managing portion sizes. So using utensils, for example, that encourage consumption of helpful foods, tongs and toggles and spoodles that are larger for those items that we want them taking, like green leafy vegetables or um, fresh fruit, and using smaller portion sizes for items that we don't necessarily want them picking up, for example, using a teaspoon for croutons. We talk about increasing convenience. Placing fresh whole fruit in an area that is highly convenient to the student, for example, right next to the register. By putting fruit in a nice bowl next to the register, we were able to increase the taking and consumption of whole fruit by 102%. Improving visibility. If kids can't see it, it doesn't exist. So this is why we talk about putting multiple iterations of whole fruit and vegetables in our space in, on our line. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they have to be separated by five feet. It could almost be a foot away from each other. It doesn't matter. Make sure that it's highly visible. Enhancing taste expectations. If it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Now, school food, unfortunately, we've done a very poor job of being good salespeople. Even individuals who work in this world tend to think of the food as bland, processed, repetitive. That doesn't sound like an awesome sales pitch at the end of the day. Hey, go eat that bland, processed, repetitive food. Come back ready to work. Now, there are amazing foods being offered. However, we need to make sure that it sounds good and it tastes good. So naming the food, highlighting them in a positive way, making them look good, even putting a small garnish on top, like a parsley sprig or some lemon juice, can be very effective at making things look professionally done. Utilizing suggestive selling. In our culture, you are always being sold something. I'm selling something to you right now, in case you haven't noticed. Selling is very important. And if you aren't selling a product, then that means the quality of the product is poor. So we talk to our food service directors and the individuals working in the lunchroom. We want to make sure that you are selling the food, giving them suggested uses. Hey, have you tried this meal? Did you know lettuce goes really well with that meal? Or would you like to try an apple or an orange with your meal today? 
And then finally, set smart pricing strategies. When we talk about increasing participation, we talk about bundling meals, putting them in multiple locations. Most recent research out of San Francisco Cisco indicated that high school students are more interested in having multiple points of service than anything. They want to be able to pick up their meal and walk away. As such, you need to make sure that you're providing them that opportunity. Now, the last thing that I'm going to talk to you about is our Smarter Lunchroom Self-Assessment Scorecard. This is a 100-point checklist that we use when we go in and evaluate school lunchrooms. What our goal is is to have 70% of all of the United States public schools in the country get a 70 on this scorecard by the year 2020. Now, most often, my, what I see, and I've done this in several hundred schools now, is that schools are scoring between the 30 and the 50 range out of 100. So this solidly puts them in the bronze category. Now, if you're getting a 51 to a 70, you are knocking it out of the park because you're doing a lot of different principles at the same time. And 71 to 100, I don't know why you're on this webinar. In this particular case, all of these items are things that you could do immediately as effective measures for evaluation. We typically recommend that you complete this annually. And of course, we offer uh, feedback and consulting if you need it. Our website is smarterlunchrooms.org. Please feel free to peruse it, look at everything we have. We have thousands of resources available to you. Please continue to ask questions and email me. My email is at the beginning. And it was a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so much, Kate, for sharing that wonderful information. Um, those are some really great ideas, and, and I think everybody on the webinar today will take something out of that and, and hopefully take it back to their school or their um, wellness councils and, and talk about the, the fun things that you can do in the lunchroom. Um, if you have questions for Kate um, or about Smarter Lunchrooms, you can enter them in the questions panel, and if we can't get to them at the end of the webinar today, then all of the questions for Kate will be forwarded and, and attached to your name and email, so Kate can help you directly. Okay. So Lauren talked to us today about applying smarter the Smart Snacks in School guidelines. Kate introduced us to the Smarter Lunchrooms movement and how we can encourage smart uh, and more nutritious choices in school meals. And now we'll talk about another important way to develop a supportive nutrition environment in your school, and that's to engage your entire school community. But before we go any further, it's time for our last poll. So who in your school community provides input in your school's nutrition program? And you can select all that apply. If you do select other, please indicate who is involved by typing that in the questions panel. Okay, it looks like the answers are slowing down. So I'll go ahead and close the poll and share with you the results. And I'm really excited to see the variety of individuals who are involved in your school nutrition program. Um, and I'm actually most excited to see that students are involved in a lot of school nutrition programs. Because while many individuals in the school are often involved in the decision-making process um, for developing nutrition plans in school, the person who is too often overlooked is the student. And they're the ones who eat most of the food that is made available. So by involving students in the nutrition decision, you allow them to have a sense of ownership and responsibility. And Kate talked a little bit about this too, um, allowing them to have choices or thinking, uh, allow them to think that they actually have a choice and have a voice in the, their own school meals.
Student committees are a great way to include the student voice in the decision-making process, whether you have student councils or well, student wellness councils or, or those types of organizations. You can have a representative um, come to meetings with school lunch professionals and administrators. Um, that's a great way to get them involved. Other ways to get them involved is to hold contests to name menu items, and as Kate mentioned, the uh, x-ray vision carrots. Well, students would have a lot of fun with naming the, the menu items, um, especially their favorite menu items. They can be involved in rearranging the lunchroom, uh, decorating the lunchroom with healthy messaging boards, uh, and even taste testing for new recipes, especially fruits and vegetables. Um, you, you may know, but you, some of you may also be su surprised that how few fruits and vegetables, um, especially younger students, have actually been exposed to. Um, so they might recognize apples and oranges and bananas, but things like raspberries and strawberries or kiwi um, might be something that they've never seen before. So uh, just some things to consider with your students. Um, when it comes to engaging teachers and administrators, it's important, important to remember to talk about how nutrition affects their bottom line. And the bottom line in schools would be students who are healthy, students who are healthy are more engaged and active learners. And it's important to remember that teachers and administrators are models for students. As a teacher or administrator or school staff, think about the choices you're making in the lunch line or at the snack bar. Are your choices guiding students to the salad bar or to the ice cream stand. Um, and reward students and entire schools with extra recess or dance parties or activity contests instead of extra snacks or pizza parties. Consider celebrating birthdays once a month instead of allowing students to bring in treats for each of their individual birthdays. There are many, many ways to encourage students and to reward students that are not necessarily um, food related. And finally, when thinking about how to get your community involved with school nutrition, don't forget to talk about all of the great things that your school is already doing. Um, there are a lot of inventories and assessments out there, um, including the one that Kate mentioned, to determine how nutrition is run in your school or how um, your healthy environment is set up. But the bottom line is that all schools are doing something good when it comes to nutrition or physical activity or other healthy environment areas. So get talking about those great things that you're doing. Um, and take your efforts beyond the walls of your school. Consider putting in a school garden and then selling that produce at a school garden stand or even using it in your own school meals. Even if it isn't your own school-grown produce, consider buying local produce from farmer, local farmers and local farm stands, and then talk to students about where that food came from, that it came from right in their own backyard. And consider learning opportunities in local grocery stores. Take students on a field trip to the produce department and talk about fruits and vegetables, like those strawberries and raspberries and things that might be unfamiliar to them. And then best of all, let them participate in a taste test. Some stores often have um, certified nutritionists or dietitians to help students and families make healthy choices when they're shopping. And a lot of, um, a lot of grocery stores and farm stands and things would be happy to work with schools and work with student groups to help students learn about these different types of fruits and vegetables that they may have never been um, exposed to previously. Okay, so we'll finish up today's webinar with a look at some resources that may be helpful as you navigate nutrition changes in your school. So there's a lot of resources on this page, um, and I'll, I'll touch base on a few of them, but know that the resources list that we're going to be sending out after the webinar includes links to all of the information on this slide um, so that you can further explore them. So the Food and Nutrition Service, USDA's Food and Nutrition Service, has many resources like Team Nutrition. Team Nutrition is a website where you can sign up for school nutrition newsletters and find resources for school meal programs, including Smart Snacks in School. 
the Healthier U.S. School Challenge, or HUSC is how it's on the screen, um, is a recognition program for schools enrolled in team nutrition. At different achievement levels, schools can actually receive monetary awards for their um, policies and, and activities around nutrition and, and activity, physical activity. USDA also offers a best practice sharing center for the Smart Snacks in School implementation. Um, My Plate resources are another great place to find nutrition resources. Um, and menu planning resources to meet all nutrition standards set forth by the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act can be found with the USDA Food and Nutrition Service. The Alliance for a Healthier Generation uh, has resources for Smart Snacks in School, including the Smart Snacks Calculator, and I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. Um, they also include examples and best practices for making changes to nutrition policies and practices. The Let's Move initiative uh, was launched by First Lady Michelle Obama and is dedicated to solving the challenge of childhood obesity within a generation. Schools can register to be Let's Move schools and have access to nutrition and physical activity resources along with receiving recognition and priority for grant funding. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention includes many resources uh, like school health guidelines to promote healthy eating and physical activity. And USDA, Alliance for a Healthier Generation, Let's Move, and CDC, and along with the Smarter Lunchrooms movement, they have inventory tools to help schools conduct self-assessments on their own nutrition policies and practices. So now I'd uh, like to close here with a mention of the Alliance Product Calculator. Um, the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, as a result of um, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act and then the Smart Snacks in School Guidelines, developed this innovative online tool. And it can be used to determine whether your beverage, snack, side, or entree item meets the Smart Snacks in School Guidelines. All you have to do is enter the product information and answer a few questions. Um, when you get the results as to whether that product actually qualifies, you can save the results or print the results. Um, and recently, the Alliance also included on their website a list of pre-approved smart snacks. So you can actually look up um, products that you're already using and uh, on that list and, and see if they're on that list already um, moving forward into the 14-15 school year. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground today, and we've actually received several questions throughout the presentation. So I'm just going to take um, a minute or two here to answer a few questions about the material as a whole. Um, there were a few questions about the, the self-assessment that was mentioned for Smarter Lunchrooms Movement, and, and um, I, I believe that that's available on the website. We'll include information about that on the resources list that we send out. Um, another one that came through was a question about if these standards prevent children from bringing in snacks for birthdays or special events. Um, and I will say at this point that the smarter or the smart snacks in school guidelines apply to foods sold in schools. So that does not necessarily apply to foods brought in from home. Um, however, if, if your school is making your changes and, and making an effort in the area of nutrition uh, by following the Smart Snacks in School guidelines, it, it will be a natural progression to start to also apply some of those standards to foods that are brought in and not necessarily sold in schools. Um. So anyway, if there are other questions, feel free to send them to the web to the email address on your screen, prowellness at phs.psu.edu. Um, we'll share all information, website or excuse me, webinar slides, the recorded version of the webinar, and um, question and answers and resources list will be available through an email link that will be coming out uh, later today. Um, and at this time, I will thank all participants for attending today. And you can also find contact information for myself, Alicia, um, and Lauren Green, and Kate Hoy on this final slide. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today.